and welcome to uh, Mahler Lunch uh, about Mahler 1 or Season 1, Episode 2, <laughs> as I like to think of it. Uh, so this would be, if we were doing it the way that we are planning on doing it in the future, this would be the broadcast that happened right after we listened to uh, Mahler's first symphony with Leonard Bernstein and the Vienna Philharmonic. Correct. So, welcome to that fun discussion. So, for Season 1, Episode 1, we decided to talk about Leonard Bernstein. Leonard Bernstein being uh, the conductor that we supposedly just watched or watched uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, and just discuss him and why he's a big deal and why some people love him and other people hate him and what, you know, what the big deal is with Leonard Bernstein, why he's uh, so good or so awful, depending on who you are. Right. Well, I'll go ahead and, and kind of give away the end. Both Logan and I think he's pretty great. So uh, now you know that we're sort of biased. But I think we have good reasons for thinking he's pretty great. Uh, he Let's see. He was born in New York, if I'm not mistaken, to a yep. Jewish family. Yes. Uh, I think his father was like a tailor or, a, or something like that. Right. But uh, he grew up, and they, they exposed him to music. He really liked music. He excelled at it. He went to... Uh, man, Harvard, and then mm -hmm. the Curtis Institute, I think. Correct. Uh, worked at Tanglewood, and he was uh, he did he was a piano player. He, he's a phenomenal pianist, and there's some really good videos of him conducting from the keyboard or being the keyboard soloist. He was a phenomenal pianist. Um, he was also also became really gifted at conducting, and was briefly under Bruno Walter, I believe, the assistant conductor of the New York Phil. And his big break came when Bruno Walter got sick and Leonard Bernstein conducted uh, a concert on very, very, very short notice. Yeah. He did a bang-up job. Everybody loved it. And so then when Bruno Walter stepped down, uh, Bernstein was appointed the regular conductor of the New York Phil. Uh, Posty held for a long time. And then he also guest conducted all over the world, uh, Vienna, right. Israel, all mm -hmm. the great places in, in Europe, and made a number of recordings with a number of different orchestras, but Logan can fill in any gaps that I left here. <laughs> right, that's pretty good. Um, yeah, I mean, he spent a really, quite a quite a while at, uh, at Vienna doing, doing his thing there. And, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, apart from his conducting, he really was... He was such a magnificent musicologist uh, for lay people. I mean, he really, uh, he did, when he was very young, he did the children's concerts with the New York Philharmonic, which were live broadcast every Sunday afternoon, and he did all kinds of uh, lectures and, and uh, you know, kind of guided listening things for, for both young people and just kind of general public people, and he had really great ideas in terms of that, like, the music doesn't need to be for the kind of high and mighty society. It needs to be for everybody. So how do we how do we explain music to people in a way that makes them go, I get this, even though I don't know the exact terminology or the, you know, I can't play the clarinet better than, you know, anybody else in the world. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's really, you know, uh, more and more I see that side of him, you know, the, 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 the educator, the, um, music scholar in that. Right, yeah, and that's that's something that one of the reasons I like him so much is because he does that sort of thing. He um, His young people's concerts were fantastic. His lectures at Harvard on the unanswered question, they were at Harvard, right? You know better than I do about that. Yes, they're at Harvard, <clears throat> and they hurt my head. <laughs> yeah, they're complicated, they're complex, but he really tries to get at the... Uh, to answer the question, like, what is music? Why is it important? Is right. it a language? How does it allow us to communicate? You know, right. what is it? What is it about music that makes it worth listening to? Yes. And the fact, the fact that he's willing to do that, or that he did mm -hmm. that, and he was such a successful artist in his way, and didn't didn't need to do that, but did it shows that that was one of those things that was like a pressing question to him. And uh, he went as far as anybody I've seen so far to answer that in a way. Right that people like you and me can understand that doesn't require, you know, I have a book called Emotion and Meaning in Music, but it's somebody's PhD dissertation <laughs> and reading it, I might as well be jamming chopsticks into my yeah, eye, it's, you know, it's, it's like... It, it's the least emotional thing to read a book about emotion and music, and he always, uh, anytime you watch him talk or speak to anybody, it's it's amazing to me how just like 
this is so good and it's so important to him. You know, like you can see that you can see that and hear that in in the way that he talks about music, like how right. important it is, how much it affects him, how much he thinks it should affect every human being. And that um, brings us to the fun <laughs> the fun point about that's also the way that he conducts his yes. music, as though everything that he was conducting was the most important and significant work in the history of the human soul. And right. uh, that it's his responsibility as conductor to wring every ounce and drop of passion <laughs> out of every second of aural stimulation that you're receiving from the music. Right. And you can see that a little bit. We well, can see it even more in Sibelius one, but I yeah. think you can see it. You start to see that in in his Mahler one with Vienna. Yeah, and we'll talk more about Sibelius one, but uh, and the weepies but... that it gives everyone ever. <laughs> Yeah, we'll talk about that more next week when we dive a little bit further into uh, Leonard Bernstein's interpretation of tempo. And and by next how... week, he means in about 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so uh, so we'll talk about it then. But, I mean, with Mahler 1, you're looking at a piece of music that was uh, so hated by the general public at the time, which uh, is so interesting. and. And it's a piece that Mahler himself said was 50 years ahead of its time, which is, I think, uh, somewhat telling me. since Leonard Bernstein came onto the scene roughly 50 years after after Mahler 1 was premiered. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at their lives, there's a lot of things that are really similar. Uh, Bernstein spent a lot of time in Vienna. Uh, Mahler lived in Vienna. Mahler was the principal conductor of New York Philharmonic for a number of years. Leonard Bernstein was the principal conductor of the New York Philharmonic for a large number of years. Uh, you know, they both had similar ideas about music. They're both uh, generally accepted to be somewhat of tyrants on the podium. They're both more famous for their conducting when they're alive than they are for their actual music. Although uh, they both were also composers. Right, exactly. And they both were composers in their free time, not as their job, which was, right. you know... Unusual um, at the time. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, so I think that's really interesting. And and I think, you know, with Mahler, uh, I think that part of what was so hard for people to grasp, I mean, you look at, uh, like, Beethoven's longest symphony is still under an hour, uh, or just right at the hour mark. And Mahler's first symphony is is right in there. You know, it's his first symphony. Beethoven 1 is like 25 minutes long or something. Mahler's first symphony is 45 right at about minutes, something 45, like that. 50 minutes, and it's got, you know, quotations of Beethoven in it. It's like this really arrogant piece of music, which is, which is so funny to me because it's like he's my age when he writes it, and he's your age when he conducts it for the first time. Right. Um, yeah. That's yeah, exactly. Humor. And he and he writes he writes the entire symphony you know being an an opera conductor uh, and specializing in the works of Wagner he's writing for a Wagnerian orchestra with all of this percussion and all of these so he's writing off stage trumpet parts and all of these things that you would find in a, like a Wagner opera and just, but he's just writing them to jump in on that um, for the pe pe people who might not be familiar with it Wagner uh, was an opera well he was a composer big name composer who gradually expanded the size of the symphony until it was gigantic. Mahler actually expanded it even more and in a few weeks, actually a few weeks, when we listen to Mahler's eighth symphony, the symphony of a thousand, <laughs> you'll understand why it's called that. But for a, for a composer starting off with his first major orchestral work, Mahler used a huge orchestra. There's seven horns, there's mm -hmm. an extra trombone, there's an extra trumpet. It's yeah, like they... basically like 125 people are going to be on stage yeah. Just for Mahler one, and yeah. so that's that's sort of where Logan was getting the because the orchestras that Wagner wrote to play the music for his operas were gigantic. Right, and regular regular opera orchestras elsewhere in Europe at the time and in the United States were not nearly that big. You know, seventy five people. You know, what is the same size as a a small regional symphony today. But the Wagner Wagnerian and then Mahler Mahlerian orchestras just got bigger and bigger, and he started off big with Symphony Number no. 1. Right. And he also, uh, he also in the third movement, um, has a, bases the entire thing on Frere Jaca, uh, but in a minor key, which I've heard likened to him uh, putting jingle bells into this major symphonic work. Like, like, he's putting this piece that everybody knows, and he's, like, changing it so that it's a bummer and not, like, happy, and it's, like, this funeral march and it's it's all this and he's like 
he's incorporating bits of of uh, like Jewish music and gypsy music, and he's putting all this stuff together. And and people are uh, at the time it was just such a confusing cacophony of sounds that that people just didn't get it. And now it's it's so standard, you know. It's so mm-hmm. you know we listen to it now. And the whole time you're just like, oh well, of course, you know, like, of course this is what would happen. But it, it's it's kind of tricky to remember that, you know, the the orchestra at the premiere left uh, during the the booze. Like they just the orchestra left and and left Mahler alone to face the booze of the crowd uh, as right. a 20, 25, 26 year old guy, uh, you know, standing up there all alone. So. And, yeah. and like his his Mahler's compositional idea, his conceit, uh, eventually became. I guess I don't know if it was at this point, but it eventually became that the symphony is a microcosm for the whole world, everything yeah. that a person can feel. So there's a lot of triumph, there's a lot of failure, there's a lot of uh, really, really, really intense and deep passion of all sorts of different ways, you know, all sorts of different means of feeling. Uh, and Mahler one hints at that. Uh, right. Mahler II, when we get into that here in a little bit, will, you know, brings it to a big, uh, a much bigger place. But Mahler I gets at that idea. It opens with, uh, um, I always think of it as the Star Trek: The Next Generation theme. Uh, <laughs> and I think, obviously, I think of it, yeah, and I think of it as uh, Leonard Bernstein continuing to tune the orchestra, uh, <laughs> right? Or right. or or Mahler writing a symphony for dogs, uh, very very high pitched. <laughs> very high very pitch high pitched strings, but then it goes into this big, um, you know, sort of celebratory awakening. Right. Uh, the first movement is, is he quotes himself, which is sort of a, a, an unusual thing for such a young composer to do. He puts his own songs in it. It'd be like if yep. uh, Beyonce did her own remix, you know, of one of her tunes. She's, yes. you know, it's just something that doesn't happen very often. Usually, it's other people quoting you. This time, he's like, well. None of you guys came to hear this song, so I'm going to put it in my first symphony. And it actually, I think it works better in his first symphony than it does as a song for tenor. But what do you, what do I know? Yeah, yeah, because um, he quotes uh, "Songs of a Wayfarer," correct? Yeah, um, yeah, which which is great, but I think I I definitely think it fits better in uh, in the first symphony, in the first movement there, and uh, mm-hmm. even later. Um, and then, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you you go. Okay, uh, then it, the second movement is, uh, this is very interesting to me, because when we watched it, it's usually taken at a fairly brisk tempo, and Bernstein takes it like, I made the analogy, it's like listening to what I imagine it would be like to see Jabba the Hutt dance. It became <laughs> this really slow Austrian dance, usually taken a lot faster, but the second movement is a sort of a waltz with a, yeah. with a klezmer, with some klezmer interlude. Yeah, and this was a place where, in the live tweet, we we disagreed. You you seemed to enjoy it a lot more than I did. I I felt that it was um, just a couple clicks too slow, uh, to the point of being almost just draggy, and and didn't it lost a lot of the energy that I thought it needed. Um, and that's just another. We'll talk. We'll talk about um, Leonard Bernstein's tempo <laughs> choices uh, at another time. Later tonight, probably. But um, yeah, I I feel like Bernstein. You know, even in he conducts uh, Elgar uh, Enigma variations, and he takes he takes the Nimrod variation at like half marked tempo. I mean, and it just doesn't have any real. <laughs> you know, it's, it's almost just falls apart at the seams. So, but we disagreed on this. I I definitely thought that it was too slow, but you seem to enjoy it. Uh, I'm, I'm a, a sucker for take, Bernstein's maybe. approach, man. He, he, his, whole, <laughs> his whole idea about wringing every ounce of emotion out of a piece, I totally go for that. And it, it right. works for me because I, 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 I'm less interested in what the score has to say than what the people have to say, you know? And that's why I will never be a successful conductor of <laughs> uh, major orchestral works. But uh, I really like his approach. And, I mean, this the second movement of Mahler 1 is not exactly life-changing it's just fun, or or you know, brooding sometimes with with hints of other things going on. But I really liked it. I like the slow tempo. Um, right. But we've been talking for a long time, so I'm going to move us into the third movement, uh, yeah. which is the minor prayer Jaca, like Logan talks about. Uh, right. Mahler decided in this movement that it was okay to write 
uh, down to a pedal F for the French horn, which I think is sort of <laughs> deserving of a slap because who writes a pedal F in in for Jaca of all the freaking things? Mahler does. Mahler does is your answer. He, and does, he can do yeah. what he wants. <laughs> he, can, he can, and he does. He gets, he gets to choose because he's Mahler. Right. Um, so we won't spend too much time on that movement. And then the fourth movement, which Bernstein took almost the taka from the first movement, like he almost did it without pausing. There's right. A, there was a pause between all the movements so that the audience can clear their throats or gain, get get consumption and diphtheria and then try and ford the river. They sound yes. like they're going to die sometimes. But <laughs> yeah. um, he doesn't take any pause hardly in this before the fourth movement. And then, boom, starts with a cymbal crash, and you can't miss it. Uh, yeah. And um, let's see. Does he quote anything important in this one? I can't remember. Oh, I'm sure he does, but I don't know off the top of my head. Because um, um, we get we get this movement has a bunch of like build ups to a really intense point and then quiet interlude and then build up to a really intense point and then quiet interlude. Yeah, I think I think that with this last movement of Mahler one, I think that um, it's really easy to see what's going to happen in the next couple Mahler symphonies. I think that it's really it, it's like he's got the ideas there, but he just hasn't tried it yet. Uh, so mm -hmm. you look at um, Mahler too, which we'll talk about um, in a little bit. But that same kind of thing happens. He's he he's building up almost to a point where it's just as big as it could possibly be, and then just stops and is dead silent. And it's like almost like it was at the end of the piece. But then like three instruments are playing, and then it builds up again and again and again, and again picks up tempo and gets faster and faster. And then it does it. It keeps dropping off. Keeps dropping off until it finally goes to the end. And then the horns didn't stand up. Oh, I know. That's the thing. It the the score clearly calls for all seven horns, the extra trumpet and the extra trombone, to stand at the end of the piece to be as loud as possible. And in Vienna, they didn't stand up, and I was heartbroken. <laughs> That's one of my favorite moments in all of music, is when they come in with that... that it's like It sounds like he's quoting from the... Uh, uh, the hallelujah thing, and he shall reign forever and ever. That's yeah. what that melody sounds like. And they come in, and it's supposed to be this just wall of sound, and the, the Vienna horns are sitting there. And Logan <laughs> Logan made the uh, the remark that because Vienna horns, which are not like regular <laughs> horns, uh, because they're so complicated, he made the joke that they actually require all of their body parts to play the instrument. <laughs> and I made the joke that it was because it was during the Cold War, and if they had stood up to play, the sound would have been so loud that the Russians and the Americans would have mistaken it for the incipient beginning of a nuclear war. <laughs> See, I, I could be incorrect, but I believe that in the score it doesn't tell them it doesn't tell them to it stand. Says may, it, it says may it, or will. It, it, it will asks the them, stand? will they please, will they please stand up? As and Leonard Bernstein then, says, no, they will not stand up because we are in Vienna. <laughs> the Vienna Philharmonic stands for no man. Exactly. Yes, it would. It would show a sign of weakness in, right. in wartime. <laughs> So um, let's see. What, let's try and quickly wrap it up for this particular episode. Where was Bernstein at in his career at this point? What was he doing? How much? How much longer was he going to be around? What did he uh, have yet was, to do? This was, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, this is uh, early 1970s, 1972 or so. And I think he was at Vienna. He had been there before, but I think this was uh, relatively near the beginning of his really long stint. Uh, guest conducting, because Vienna Philharmonic, unlike every other orchestra in the world, never has an actual principal conductor. So, like, uh, the Berlin Philharmonic, Simon Rattle is there for 85% of the concerts, unless they have a guest conductor. Um, Los Angeles has Gustavo Dudamel. The Vienna Philharmonic never has a, a actual principal conductor. They just have, like, really, like, this guy will be the guest conductor for six years or however long. So, so I think that this is right at the start of Bernstein. Uh, starting his thing at Vienna, and it's, uh, if I remember correctly, it's the start of, they were televising them, um, all all of the uh, Mahler symphonies, uh, maybe for the first time, because um, I know, I think, I, think so, that, yeah. I think that all of them, all of the ones that they did with Vienna Philharmonic are, are on YouTube, up on YouTube, and they all, they all are very, they start exactly the same way, they have a picture of Mahler, like, and then they like go through all the soloists and stuff, and but right. uh, yeah, so I, I believe that this is right at the start. But he still has about twenty years left in his life, um, 
because he dies in what ninety two. Is that correct? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. He was a lifelong heavy smoker, and his last concert was almost derailed um, by a coughing fit he suffered. He had emphysema right. since he was twenty three. So it's sort of yeah. remarkable he he lasted as long as he did. But right. Um, so this I, w- I guess what I was getting at is that this is sort of Bernstein at the peak of his power, at yeah. the peak of his popularity with one of the best orchestras in the world. So yeah. at some point I'll put a link up right here, hopefully if I can manage, to the video that we watched. And then another link, maybe on this side of my head this time, to uh, our blog where we talk about it. And uh, then uh, I guess we'll go from there. And then maybe down right. here I'll put a link to something else just because I like to point at the different areas of the screen. Um, All right. But I think uh, I think that should do it for our discussion of Mahler 1. Right. Uh, Next up is Sibelius. Next up is Sibelius 1, so I'm going to go ahead and end this broadcast, and we'll be back in a few minutes uh, to talk about Sibelius 1 in Season 1, Episode 3 of the Mahler Lunch uh, After Party. So we'll, we'll catch you there. See you in a bit. Bye. Thank you. Bye.